Hello and welcome to another episode of Canadian Stagger. Today I'm at the Shadow Hydroelectric Generating Dam. I wanted to get a perspective from the front of it. Um, the fun police have basically made it so that you can't go down to the front of the dam, so I have absolutely no intentions of going anywhere near the front of it. Um, they have no trespassing signs everywhere, um, threatening to find the ever-living life out of anyone who should dare approach the riverbed. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to come in and, you know, come down on the bottom end. But uh, now that I've got that out of the way for the day, let's uh, go for a walk out. So yeah, today, what's today's video about? Well, the uh, downgrading of the uh, US credit uh, is pretty much uh, what I'm interested in talking about today. Going from AAA to AA plus does not, I can't go that way, it does not bode well. So yeah, AAA to AA plus. Basically that's because the US is borrowing more money than anticipated. And uh, when you're, uh, you know, basically borrowing the ever living life out of everything all the time, um, eventually your creditors get worried that you're not gonna pay them back. That happens to everybody uh, that's in the world and uh, governments can't escape from that. And uh, that's uh, gonna be part of what the future has in store for our financial banking system, so. Yeah, quite the drop. Gonna have to shimmy this. So yeah, the uh, like I said, the U.S. government got downgraded, and uh, another thing that I read in the news is, uh, well, Japan's having a real hard time uh, in their bond market, and they're basically, I don't know if I went the right way. Well, maybe you'll get an interesting, interesting video when I fall off this ledge. But an interesting uh, thing, you know, like they're literally uh, uh, dealing with their bond market right now. And uh, one of the leaders of Japan basically said that if push comes to shove, they will literally dump all of their American bond holdings. And seeing as they're one of the largest, if not the largest bond holder in America, that's kind of very uh, unsettling news. Like how quickly would they unroll that? Probably probably very quickly because if they started they'd want to get maximum benefit out of their dollars right away Which would then in turn trigger more selling Which would then basically cause hyperinflation in the United States of America as trillions of dollars of bond debt who don't want to lose those trillions of dollars in bond debt start going out the window so there is that and uh it's unfortunate, but uh, that's the way that things are rolling right now. And uh, it's not looking so great in Europe either. You know, like they're having their financial difficulties as well. And there's been many books published, um, not big predominant books, nothing that most people would know about, but if you're a stacker and a prepper, more than likely uh, you've at some point or another read these uh, documents, these books, I basically say that if Europe collapses, the U.S. follows within 8 to 12 weeks. And uh, I'd have to say I agree with that statement. Here in Canada right now, things are, are getting ugly. I'm going to be honest, really ugly. Now, you guys know I work in the outdoor adventure and all that. Uh, it's nothing that I hide or shirk away from. Yeah, these are those nifty little signs on this side. If you climb down onto the riverbed over here, uh, yeah, they'll get mad at you. So there's a little bit of a trail over there that I went and walked to kind of get a downside perspective of this. But it's, uh, here, I'm gonna put the phone down for a moment. Put up with me for a quick second. I just wanna put my sunglasses back on. But, uh, you know, it's a, a perspective that is reality. And most, uh, most Americans need to, and Canadians need to, realize that this is coming now do i think it's going to be today like i always say no it's a slow burn right now um there are things that are indicating to me now though that the end is getting closer and closer um you know like i see things i see writing on the walls um basically uh, china in its own foreign uh you know exporting has now exceeded the u.s dollar in the number one currency in their country that's utilized now for shipping uh, out of its own country 
Now that's big news. I believe they said 49% to the U.S.'s 45%, uh, and the rest is made up of other other countries. But uh, yeah, so the U.S. has lost basically dominant status in China, which is to be expected as China is the rising power and uh, the U.S. is the waning power, and uh, that's uh, pretty much how it's going right now. Um, now the other thing, the, everybody's talking about how Saudi Arabia literally signed a we're going to back uh, China and our money's our, our oil is going to get sold to China. Now, if push comes to shove, China does right at this current time, I believe, get 65 to 70 percent of their oil uh, through uh, the South China Sea through some choke points. The U.S. could just like choke the ever living snot out of, uh, and they could literally stop the sales of of oil. Uh, they can control Saudi Arabia's flow of oil out. Uh, by by blockade so that's not really a big concern for the u.s the yes i'm, I'm going to say that the, because we have rule of law right now uh the u.s isn't going to do anything to handicap saudi arabia um publicly uh to sell their uh, oil however they see fit but but um behind closed doors i'll guarantee you that the talks are not very good now everybody's saying joe biden doesn't know how to negotiate i'm not saying joe does but his team probably does and ultimately they want to keep oil in their cars just like the rest of us so um what is the big concern for us though like where do we see the big concern like in the next five years me i see the consolidation of a failed russia being a big problem most of China's needs are currently being supplied by importation through their seaports. But Ch Russia has huge amounts of natural gas, oil reserves, forests, gold, iron, all that in Eastern Asia and Siberia. Lots of it. And right now, 30% of all the Russian natural gas is coming in through that way. But that could easily be ramped up and more stuff could be brought in. And when China's dependency of the, on the Middle East and the, and, and, and the rest of the world, like ourselves, Canada, uh, you know, for exporting metals to it and, 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 and Germany come to an end, you know, once Russia is able to fill that gap, because see, Russia doesn't have a lot of money because all the sanctions and everybody's treating it like uh, another larger version of North Korea, but China has never said a bad thing about them. And once the Russians get to the point where they can start shipping more and they get these pipelines finished and these oil drilling rigs done, they're opening up, allowing Chinese workers to come into their country, uh, you know, to continue working on these projects. Once that amount goes from, like, I believe I said 10 years ago, it was 15% or less. Now it's 30. You go forward five more, you know, you're getting probably up to the 45% range. And as this continues to climb, um, China's going to become more and more emboldened because the U.S. can't shut down their economy, you know? That's what's stopping China right now from blitzing Taiwan. Like, I understand that the fight would be difficult. There'd be many dead people, uh, all that stuff. I understand that that's a reality, and I'm not saying that it's not in my thought processes, but what I will tell you is, is once China doesn't fear having its oil cut off to its war machine, or its manufacturing machine. That, that is when it will act, when it gets a high enough amount, or when it believes that either it can't wait any longer because of some reason that the US has put on them or other powers. Because we gotta remember, Taiwan is classified as a major non-NATO ally, so is South Korea, you know, um, you know, you know Australia, Japan, all these countries are major non-NATO allies. And I believe that, uh, Vietnam is actually on the list to, to get into that group of uh, special United States friends. And these are all contain <laughs> me, containment nations of China to not allow them access to the world ocean, um, you know, without having to go through a choke point. So that's what's going on right now. That's, that's the big geopolitical game, game right now, is to keep China bottled up behind that, um, that line of the first island chain, to keep them in there so that they can't escape. You know, you can't blow up an unsinkable aircraft carrier, which are the on-land air bases. You know, you can cluster bomb, munition it up, you can do all that stuff all you want, but uh, all you need to do is go out there with uh, bulldozers and, you know, you can refill in the potholes and that base can be up and running in, in, in much quicker time than you can build an aircraft craft carrier or an actual excuse me an actual um a fully serviced air base like you got uh, 
you know, like standard, uh, uh, you know, um, concrete runways, we'll say, boom, you drop a, you, a munition in it, you blow a hole in it, um, you go out there with some uh, dump trucks and some bulldozers, you pour gravel in, and then you either put asphalt right on top uh, you, for a temp patch, or, or you literally just uh, pour the cement right back on, and 12 hours later it's hard, and you can start landing planes again. So <laughs> that's a real problem for, uh, for China, is their inability to... Um, basically knock out uh, NATO and the US and all of our allies uh, abilities to bring superior air power. Now everybody's saying China's got all these modern aircrafts, you know, fifth generation and all that. Yes, okay, great. I'll agree that they've got a decent fifth generation fighter. I'm not going to say whether it is or isn't. I'm just going to agree for the debate that they have one. But how many do they have? You know, 20, 50, 100? Uh, the US has a thousand uh f-35s on on the con on the conveyor belt right now you know like not to exclude their uh f-22s uh all their all their fifth generation stuff they've got a sixth generation fighter now in trial the u.s uh and if you include nato and you add all the nato countries together you add japan into that group you add south korea because it's going to be everybody fist fighting everybody without nuclear weapons involved china's screwed in the air um you know they've got this great missile capability um, but that can be degraded. That can be degraded. Um, you know, anti-missile capability, that can, uh, anti-plane, uh, that can be all degraded. Um, now, would it be a lot of major loss of life? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think that we're in the next 10 years going to see a massive financial unraveling. The U.S. is unraveling itself. Now, a lot of um, groups are now saying that the U.S. has borrowed this amount of money back to this, um, you know, double A plus credit rating. Um, there is a 3D chess move that's being played here by the U.S., that uh, I don't think a lot of content creators are seeing. Uh, maybe I'm going off uh, on a on a tangent with this one. If you if you think that my idea sounds off the wall and no, it's not possible, let me know in a comment. But if you agree with me, let me know as well because like I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on on this idea. I think that the U.S. is borrowing more money to fill up their bank account because they know they have to raise interest rates much higher. So what they're doing is they want to have a trillion dollars sitting in their slush fund so they can run the government until the end of the next federal election, which is November next year. So they want to have a trillion, trillion and a quarter in there to be able to run it out until the election's over. Once the election's over and we know, you know, we know Joey B's in there again, if, that, if that's really what's going to happen, um, you know, they'll let the country go to crap for four years. They will. But um, they want to borrow the money so that they can get it at this lower 10-year 5% or 4% rate that they can gain access to now because they know beyond a shadow of a doubt they have no choice but to raise rates because the Fed pretends like they control interest rates, but they don't. The interest rates, it's all based on the 10, the 2, the 5, you know, all those rates dictate what the Fed's going to do. Like, the Fed isn't walking the rate, the rate's walking the Fed. So... <clears throat> They try to pretend like they're they're in front of it, but they're not. So, um, what do I what do I see happening? Like I said in previous videos, I don't think this stops until at least seven percent. You know, we're going to seven percent prime uh, prime rate. You know, your Fed rate seven percent, and then you're looking at your average uh, home mortgage with really good credit, eight and a half, maybe nine percent. The only two percent on top. Um, some people are uh, are even saying uh, the Fed's rate could go as high as ten. I, I don't know yet. I don't. I don't. I don't see a. Uh, I don't see a path to 10 yet, but that doesn't mean it's not going to open up in the next year. And I'm going to go, aha, you know, like we've got a U.S. jobs report number coming out. And I think that is going to change uh, the whole idea of what's going on. It's coming up pretty soon. Um, I think we're going to see some serious, um, serious numbers that they've been hiding. I also, um, I also wanted to tell you that the um, rafting companies that are around where I'm at now, bear in mind, this is just rafting, you know, I don't know nothing, but discretional spending, the first thing we do when we can't afford to buy groceries, we can't afford to put gas in our car, we can't afford to put clothes on our kids, our, our grandchildren are suffering, you know, our nieces and nephews need us because they're homeless. What do we do? We cut the discretional spending. You know, what's discretional spending? Anything you can live without i.e. rafting trips. Now, um, in 2008, the great financial crisis, it did absolutely nothing according to sales, according to the owner of the company I worked for, nothing. He didn't even notice a, a, a momentary drop in, uh, in clients. COVID, nothing. We saw actually increased numbers, but that was due to the fact we were the only ticket in town. I'll take that on the chin in 2020. Uh, in 2021 and 2022, when they were pumping out, uh, they were pumping out money like crazy, Rafting was going like crazy, but they, they shut the tap off. 
They shut the tap off and the real economy is starting to show its head. And our numbers, our numbers are drastically, drastically down. Uh, we usually every day run between 40 and 60 guests down the river from, I'd say, uh, the end of school to the beginning of school. So 60 to 70 days straight, we're running 40 to 60 people in our in our company every day. And in preseason, we're running 10 to 20. And come after September, uh, seventh Labor Day here in Canada, uh, the numbers, uh, they, uh, they drop down. But they're still between... Uh, you know, five and 15 go down the river every day uh, for September and we get a couple of bookings in, in October in the cooler weather because people want to see the leaves change on the tree, which is absolutely outstanding. So if you're in the area, you want to see that, we can we can provide that. But this back back to what I'm talking about. Our numbers are abysmal. Um, I usually work from May 1st until I'd say the end of September and I usually get one week off during that time. But that's including my... my uh, my weekends I get like seven to ten days off and that's my weekends included over that four month window so you know um, right now I'm literally getting two to four days off a week because um, there's not enough work uh, to keep uh, everybody employed uh, at the level that we usually are at um, I've decided like I'm, I'm management I, I don't really have to do this but I've decided to take my 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 full 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 time down to just full time so like I've dropped my hours from uh, like 70 to 80 90 sometimes a week uh, and I'm just running a 40 hour 30 hour work week uh, right now because uh, there's a bunch of younger people that uh, that need to, to stay employed and by me taking a few extra days off it pushes around the money a little bit and maybe can help some other people out I'm not financially um, doing well by doing this, but I'm not going to lose any any sleep over it because, well, I'm prepared for for this sort of event. Uh, my wife kind of agrees with it. But back to the numbers, we're down 30 to 40 percent. Uh, we usually have 12 to 14 uh, um, full-time raft guides that work for us. Well, they're not full-time, but they work around base and everything. Like in total, it's 14 staff, and uh, that's what we take to run. We need uh, nine people, 10, 11 people on the river crew at all times, and then we need three to four at base camp, uh, looking after uh, cleanup, uh, looking after making pizzas, uh, looking after running shuttle runs for canoe trips, etc., etc., etc. Well, right now we're pared down to eight staff. That's it. We don't need more than eight staff, and we're still not working at full time for everybody. So um, we've taken a uh, 40 to 50 percent drop in numbers, uh, and I've double checked this with other companies. Um, there are five other companies, and all of them are as bad or worse uh, in situation than where I'm at. Now we're talking um, tens of thousands of people this summer are not coming up to have vacations in the Ottawa River Valley, which is literally 70 minutes north of Ottawa and four and a half hours east of Toronto and three hours from Montreal. And they come up here by the droves and this place is usually doubles in population over the course of the summer. Um, you notice a huge bump in everybody being around. Well, guess what? People aren't even coming up to use their camper trailers. And I think this is gonna spill over um, in September into hunting season. Hunting is big in this area. We get a lot of out of city people that come up to go hunting. I think that I, as an outfitter, I'm going to find my, 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 my volume drops immensely. I've prepared for this now, um, but not only do I see it dropping in September for uh, bow for moose and bow for deer, but I think come rifle season in November and oct late October, uh, I think I'm going to see the same thing. And I think it might be worse. And that's because people can't afford to, uh, you know, throw a thousand dollars onto a hunting trip because they need to make the bills and uh that's where we're at i truly believe that uh right now they're saying there is no recession i i, I see a major recession and uh not just one um that's uh small because like i said in 08 and in 99 this company was running in the, in the dot-com bubble this company was running in 2008 it's been running in every single recession since 1992 it's been running in the mall and it's never noticed a drop in clientele always we've always gone up in numbers or stayed the same we've never had a year of decrease ever and this year in one year 30 to 40 percent down overnight and that's not just in one company that's in five so um the, literally, the uh, entertainment industry is dead, like where I live. It is dead. Um, we have zip line parks. We have uh, canoe trip companies. Like, we have hundreds of companies in this region. And what they do is they cater to uh, people wanting to get out into this, into nature. Like, I know I'm at a dam, and it's not quite so awesome. And speaking of dams, they're uh, doing maintenance down here and drilling the channel wider. Not sure why that's happening. But uh, they come up here because they want to see this. This is where the Ottawa river uh 
provincial parks on the Quebec and the Ontario side literally begins right here and it goes upriver for about 20 kilometers and it's a beautiful place and they come here to see that they don't only come for that but they come to go down Black River where I was the other day uh, to go down the Fort Kalunge, the Gatineau, the Oudaway, uh, the Rouge, uh, the Kippewa, uh, just to name a couple you know and and they come here because they want to get away from you know the city they need to decompress they need to allow their brains to readjust so that they can go back into another another winter of of stay, sitting behind a keyboard and and going nowhere and they're not doing it and that's a very telltale sign i believe that uh things are going to get pretty bad pretty soon and uh i don't know about you guys but i'm concerned i'm greatly concerned and uh to me that is more concerning than anything else. You know, I, uh, I don't know where I stand on it anymore. Like, uh, I've been trying to say that the economy is probably going to be doing well, but, uh, I'm going to be honest. Uh, I'm starting to, I, I'm just gonna say it. I truly believe we're, we're here. We're here. This is it. We're not seeing, a, um, anything other than what we've seen previously, you know, first, uh, you know, first died the stock market. You know, that happened, uh, you know, in 2000s when the tech bubble blew up. Then the uh, the real estate market, the, you know, and all that. We, we, we all, in the, in, you know, it once again took a big shock in 2008. You know, the stock and the, the real estate market uh, took a hit. We're taking a big major hit with the real estate now. Uh, commercial is like done. Uh, home prices are falling, um, you know, and, and what is it telling me? our financial system now is dying. So I see the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know about the rest of you, but stack harder. I'm going to, um, I've got a fair chunk. I'm probably going to go in 50% now. Uh, I think we're, we're there now. Um, I truly believe that, uh, that this is a tipping point and after after the summer we're going to see it kick in on earnest coming in September. Uh, it's going to, it's going to steamroll and it's going to get ugly by Christmas. So, um, I'm going to start spending some of my my dry powder that I have for precious metals, uh, and I'm going to start uh, dollar cost averaging in and buying probably uh, larger swaths now of, of precious metals. I'm going to stack. I've got a very large silver stack, so what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to dollar cost average in on some gold. Um, like the world banks are like the banks are buying gold. Uh, I think I'm going to follow suit. I'm going to try to get myself 10 ounces of uh, gold on top of what I have by uh, by October. Um, five's my minimum goal, 10 to 12 is what I'd like, but uh, I'm going to see if I can pull off a five ouncer, uh, by the end of October. So, uh, once again, this is a Canadian stacker. If you've enjoyed this content, you know, please uh, consider subscribing to the channel, uh, and leaving a like, uh, comment if you enjoyed the video or not, let me know, uh, let me know what you thought. And, uh, you know, basically I hope that, uh, you, uh, have a great day. Uh, just remember, this is always just a dude by the river. It's not financial advice. Uh, this is just what I'm doing for myself and how, what I feel and I believe. Um, and if you're like-minded, you know, uh, you know, go ahead and, uh, you do what you need to do for you. And, uh, just remember that, uh, life is uh, precious and your family is the most important thing and do what you need to, to, to look after yourself and your loved ones first, and then, uh, worry about the world, you know, uh, cause the world's going to do whatever it's going to do, whether you're there or not. So, until next time, this is Canadian Stacker. Have a great day.